everyone, I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. On today's episode, I had an awesome opportunity to meet with Dr. Neil Bernard, President and Founder of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Vegetarian Hall of Fame inductee, and author of 20 books. He is a leading expert and advocate for plant-based nutrition and higher standards of research. Today, he discusses his book, Your Body in Balance, which is all about how the foods we eat can affect our hormones and contribute to chronic disease. In addition, he discusses the role of vitamin D in a vegan diet in preventing the coronavirus. Lastly, he shares what fast food restaurant he would go to and what he would have. This is a great episode, and I know it will impact your health. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. All right. Well, I just want to tell you, you've made a huge impact on my life, obviously many others. Um, So just as it reflects on health and avoiding dairy products, meat products, that's stuff I didn't even know about, even getting through NP school. You know, I got out of NP school, and suddenly it's like, wow, this is huge, learning about all of this. You are, you are not alone. It's been kind of a neglected thing for so many people. Yeah. Um, I know even just the ethical side of it all, I don't think people really realize all of it. I know I didn't. Um, so I don't think I can ever look at dairy and cows the same again after hearing everything that you've taught me about them. Yeah. Yeah, it's really true. Um, So what, you know, it's, you've accomplished a lot in your journey um, from switching over to plant-based, really vegan, because vegan really just says you're not eating meat and dairy products, correct? As opposed to just being plant-based? Well, different people use the words differently, uh, but a vegan diet is is a great thing for people because it means you're getting the animal products out of your life. And that's a a terrific thing. And then some people want to go a little bit further and, and make sure they're having unrefined foods and and they're maybe throwing out the potato chips and that kind of thing too. But, uh, but I don't want to disparage If a person has, has found a way to break up with meat and break up with cheese and, and to really embrace their vegetables and fruits and so forth, that's a, that's a great thing. Yeah. So what, what prompted you to find the, uh, be the founder of the Physicians Committee uh, for Responsible Medicine? Back in 1985, I was working in New York and I was struck by how we were not very good at prevention. We, did, we didn't do anything about a heart attack until, it came, until a person had a heart attack and it came into the emergency room. But you know, if we thought about it, somebody saw that patient and knew the patient had a high cholesterol level uh, or high blood pressure or excess weight and didn't really help the patient to conquer those issues. And then you see the results. Um, or we didn't do anything about breast cancer mm-hmm. until you see it on the mammogram. But on the other hand, the doctor saw that patient beforehand, and we know some of the steps that we can take to reduce the risk. Now, these steps are not perfect. Mm -hmm. You can still get diseases even if you're following a pretty healthy lifestyle. But in medicine, we need to advocate for that. And so I decided to set up this group, the Physicians Committee, to try to argue for preventive medicine. And that means especially nutrition. Mm -hmm. But we do more than that. We also do research studies on healthy diets and, and argue for more ethical and effective kinds of research as well. Mm-hmm. And then you opened the Bernard Medical Center. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, 2016, we opened up a primary care clinic here. We've got three doctors and a nurse practitioner and about four registered dietitians and a whole staff. And they love it. Um, you know, we, we, we will use medications if we need to. We can mm-hmm. get x-rays and labs and just all the usual things at any clinic. However, if you come in with a high cholesterol level, we are not gonna pretend that this is somehow a lip toward deficiency disease, we're going to say, well, let's, let's work on your diet too, and maybe we won't need medication. Um, if you have diabetes, yeah, we can, we can renew your prescriptions or write you new prescriptions, mm-hmm. but there's a shot we can get rid of this disease for you mm-hmm. if we work on our diet and lifestyle. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, patients will very often bring their reluctant spouse with them who's you know, gee, what are we getting into here? And it ends up being a life-changing experience for all of them, uh, where they realize that, that food has more power than they had imagined, and that power is in their hands. It is unbelievable, actually, um, on an aspect of it. And I realize, I mean, that's what 
I really kind of started doing this for as I learned more and I grew in, you know, I lost both of my parents young, just to give you a little background. My dad was 43 of lung cancer. My mom was 56 of uh, myelofibrosis. I'm sure you know what that is, that rare bone cancer. I carry the BRCA2 indeterminate gene. I have to be rechecked for that. So I've got some big risk factors. Um, so really I got done with NP school. I had just had an awful year dealing with back pain, which you talk about in your book. I was surprised to see, and I felt terrible. Got a call from my aunt. You actually have met her before. And she said, Kim, you have got to change something. So I did. I started watching all the documentaries and learning a lot about it. And then boom, it was like a passion grew. And literally I'm an urgent care nurse practitioner. I'm getting these patients in there and I'm like, oh, we, we can do so much with this. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, I got to get to a different platform and really start talking more about this because it really is impactful on people's lives. It sure is. Um, so I see that you have extended Bernard Medical Center to telemedicine and even here in Missouri, which is huge. How did Missouri make your list? Um, because our uh, medical director is James Loomis, MD, who used to uh, be there in St. Louis. In fact, he was, when, when the St. Louis Rams team was there, uh, he was their doctor. Uh, and he was also the doctor for the baseball team, the, the Cardinals. Okay. Uh, and also for the symphony. And then he had a huge practice and he was involved with Washington University and so forth. And anyway, he, in his own life, uh, he adopted a plant-based diet and he found that it was pretty miraculous for him. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, yeah. but, but that's exactly what he would say. He lost weight. He improved his health dramatically. And Jim is, a, is um, he's not just a doctor, but he's an outstanding athlete. Um, he just turned 60. I don't think he's going to mind my telling you this. And for his 60th birthday, he ran an Ironman triathlon. And wow. I think, oh my God. That's impressive. He, he, well, yeah. It, it, he, I mean, most 60 years old people, yeah. you know, people that age wouldn't consider. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, the, I've the seen the day, spectrum, yes. He came out here and he's been running our clinic and um, he's still licensed in Missouri. And so from there, we've encouraged all of our clinicians to not only be licensed here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. but wherever they trained or somewhere else. So uh, people do visit us with telemedicine mm -hmm. and they can come from Missouri uh, without changing clothes. And you can leave your pajamas on and you can come right. and see, see us through telemedicine. But people in California and in New York and Maryland and Virginia, and of course, here in D.C., but uh, Massachusetts and many other states, people will consult either with one of our doctors or one of our registered dietitians, and and it's 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 a really good thing for people because now with the pandemic, many people are nervous about going into a doctor's office, right. and if you can just call somebody up and say, "Let me make an appointment." Very often, we will squeeze them in the very same day. That's awesome. And they can they can have an appointment. Uh, they can take a good long time if they're a new patient or if they just need a quick follow up. It's mm -hmm. it's been just a, a lifesaver, I have to say. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, by the way, I should, I should probably tell you how to do it, if you don't mind. No, uh, that's pass great. This along. Uh, we have a, a website. It's barnardmedical.org. So you just go to barnardmedical.org, uh, click on the link, and, and you'll be able to hook up with a live person. Um, or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you pick up the phone, you call 202-527-7500, and a human being will answer the phone, and we'll get you scheduled for, for an appointment. That's awesome. What about, so then they could even do like, blood work. I know we, you know, get their levels checked and all kinds of different things. Right. We, yes. We'll, we'll arrange with a, a, a lab near you, or we, if you need an x-ray, we can get x-rays. Um, there are certain conditions where telemedicine is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, if I need to listen to your heart, for example, telemedicine is not good. Um, so our doctors are very clear, which are conditions where telemedicine works, which are conditions where you have to be in the same room with you know, where the doctor and patient have to interact. Um, they're very clear about that. Um, but for, I would say, 80% of cases, maybe more, depending on what the condition mm -hmm. is. When we're dealing with diabetes and hypertension and so forth, very often uh, a telemedicine visit is, is what the person really needs. And mm -hmm. for when, when people feel that medicine is only uh, effective when they go to the clinic, sometimes they put it off, mm -hmm. especially now. There are so many people who are saying, I'm not going out, I'm not going out. Right. And then they're in trouble. Um, right. And so with telemedicine, we can refill their prescriptions. We can get labs if we need to. We can get x-rays. We can do whatever we need to. And it's, it's uh, fast and it works really well. 
Yeah, that's awesome. That's an awesome service. Well, speaking of a pandemic, um, I would love to hear your um, thoughts on risk factors and ways to decrease mortality and the role of vitamin D. Interesting topics. Uh, when the pandemic came in, one of the first things that we noticed, not we, but the scientific community noticed, was that people with high blood pressure had more, if they were infected with COVID, they were more likely to do badly. And the same was true with diabetes. Uh, people with diabetes tended to do badly. Um, if, if you've got COVID and you have diabetes, you are much more likely to die of COVID than a person who has, has the infection but doesn't have diabetes. However, some important new research came out of China where of course it all began and so there were thousands of people to be studied. It turned out that if you looked at people who had diabetes but it was poorly controlled mm -hmm. and you compare them to people who had diabetes but it was, it was well controlled and when I say well controlled, they were either taking their medic medications or with lifestyle changes, they were keeping their blood sugar in a good range. Mm -hmm. The mortality difference was about tenfold different. It was wow. about, the, the, the mortality was about 1% in the well-controlled cases and about 11% in the poorly controlled cases. Wow. So what this means uh, is that, yeah, you, you want to wash your hands, right. you want to wear a mask, we want to do social distancing, we want to self-quarantine, we want to do all those things. Right. But those things fail, they fail a lot. Mm -hmm. And there are new infections every single day. Right. And so you have to assume that it could happen to you. Mm -hmm. So what that means is let's deal with these underlying conditions as if right. our life depended on it. Because nine out of 10 deaths occur in people who have an underlying condition. Right. So the mm -hmm. only underlying condition you can't change is your age. People over 60 are at higher risk. You can't right. make the clock go backward. But hypertension can improve and it can improve fast. Mm -hmm. When people change their diets, within two weeks time, their blood pressure comes down. And when I say change their diets, Get the animal products out of your diet, bring the vegetables and fruits and healthy foods into your diet, and it makes just such an enormous difference. You actually answered one of my questions. I wanted to ask that how quick will it make a difference? Because I think that, you know, people want to know, well, how fast can I, you know, make changes that actually show some improvement? That well, the figure that, I gave, figure that I gave of two weeks, that comes from the DASH study, the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension mm -hmm. study. It was, it was the classic blood pressure study done back in the late 90s. And they brought in 459 people. And those people who increased vegetables and fruits and reduced meat and fat had, or it was an eight week study. Mm -hmm. but within 14 days, two weeks, their blood pressure was lower, uh, quite significantly lower. I would suggest two things. Uh, number one is don't wait, do it now. Right. Number two, don't just reduce meat and reduce fat, throw the meat out. Right. Um, if you have been paying any attention to what's going on in slaughterhouses these days, you don't want to eat anything out of that place at all. Um, <laughs> we, we have had uh, 15, no, 16,000 cases of COVID-19 in slaughterhouse workers, 200 in slaughterhouse inspectors. We've had 60 deaths of slaughterhouse workers from COVID, well, this is all COVID-19. And five of the inspe and the inspectors are the most hygienic people in the place. They are the most safety conscious people in the place. Mm -hmm. 200 of them in the United States have come down with this disease and five of them are dead. My thought is who would want to eat anything coming out of those places? Um, and the virus survives in refrigeration and in freezing temperatures, exactly what meat is. So anyway, I would not go near it. And, well, and, it, and, and if, you, if you make these changes, your blood pressure improves, your diabetes improves, your weight improves, your underlying right. conditions are all getting better. Right, exactly. And so I know, I, I'm sure you've seen all the articles lately about the meat shortages and the, yeah, definitely the people dying in the meat slaughterhouses. But the, the article I wanted to bring your attention to was Monday, CNN, the article was about the meat sort shortages being a good thing and how people are choosing healthier diets, they're cutting out some meat, choosing alternatives. The article was great up to the point it was talking about, yes, reducing meat improves your health. But then they went on to say, except poultry. Poultry is fine. You don't need, there's no ill effects with poultry. So I wanted to know your response to that. Well, I guess I would say two things. Um, one is re regard to just the typical cholesterol and saturated fat issue. Uh, poultry is is only marginally different from, from red meat. 
it's very little different at all. It's, it still has cholesterol. But keep in mind, when you're eating beef, you're eating the muscle the cow uses to move their legs. When you're eat, eating chicken, you're using the muscles the cow moves to, to uses to move their wings or their legs. Mm -hmm. um, when you're eating fish, you're use, eating the muscle that the fish uses to move their tail around. It's not dramatically different. It's not broccoli, let me put it that way. Right. Um, right. And, and so even if, even if you were to take, take the chicken off, the, the, the skin's chicken, to remove the skin from the mm -hmm. chicken breast, throw away the dark meat, don't add any fat to it. It's mm -hmm. still about 23% fat. Right. Um, much of that is saturated fat. It raises your cholesterol. It's nothing like the plant-based diet. But with regard to COVID, I got to tell you, the slaughterhouse workers in the poultry plants, are, they've got COVID too. Um, we, it's, it's, I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. And Maryland is right over there, a uh, couple blocks over. And Maryland, Virginia, Delaware. There are a huge number of chicken plants around here. And people raise chickens on the chicken farms. They are now, in many cases, killing them on the farm. They're not sending them to slaughter. They end up in a landfill. Wow. Why? They're killing them because they got no place to send them. Uh, the slaughterhouses have so much disease that their slaughterhouse workers are staying home and they can't process the chickens anymore. So, no, chicken is not, it's a dead bird. It is not health food. And what about fish? Because you know everybody thinks fish is a healthier choice. Yeah, well, um, what's going for fish is that it does have more omega-3 fatty acids in it. Those are good fats. But the problem is that most of the fat in fish is not omega-3. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at, uh, say, Chinook salmon, and you compare it to beef, when you look at the bad fat in it, it's almost identical. The bad fat is saturated fat. When right. you look at the cholesterol content, it's almost identical. And the fact that there's some omega-3 sprinkled in there, does not make it a health food. Plus, I mean, I mean, let's face it, when it comes to things like mercury and industrial chemicals, fish is at the top of all those lists of foods to avoid. You're pregnant, maybe you shouldn't be eating fish, da, da, da. I would skip it. Right. Um, so, you know, in, it, I, I don't know how you respond to all this with every place that I've looked in the research, the NIH, the Cancer, you know, cancer Council, all of these sites recommend reduce meat for your diet, for your health. It's cancer causing. I mean, processed meats are a level one what, carcinogen. So it's amazing to me that it's still like marketed, sold, and it, it's just like business as usual, even knowing these underlying facts. We're very much as we were with tobacco. Um, when I was in medical school, people knew that tobacco caused lung cancer, but it was still widely, widely sold. And I have to confess to you that I bought it. Mm -hmm. um, I would go into my hospital, George Washington University <laughs> Hospital, and you walk in the door and there was the gift shop. And they sold Merritt menthols and Marlboros and everything else. And I bought them and my head of surgery would buy Marlboros and we would light up walking down the hallway um, into the doctor's lounge, which was filled with smoke. And we weren't stupid. We, we just knew that you know, we were under stress and I mean, we knew it caused cancer. We just knew we had to quit eventually. Well, right. that's where we are with meat. Um, yeah. People know that it causes colorectal cancer. They know that meaty diets are associated with heart attacks. Mm -hmm. um, but we have kind of the what the hell attitude. Life is short, live it up. Right. And you suddenly realize, I don't want to be obese and I don't want to have right. high cholesterol. I, you know, you don't want to start dying. Right. Early. And then I guess the other piece of it is, is that people start to, to realize that a plant-based diet actually tastes better than what you're eating now. And, right. and that people didn't, didn't believe. I didn't believe that. Right. Um, in North Dakota, when I was growing up, it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn every day. And I thought, oh, that's great. You know, on special occasions, roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. You know, very exciting. Now that I'm on a vegan diet, it can be um, Italian, like angel hair pasta topped with an arrabbiata sauce with some grilled asparagus on the side, or Mexican, a bean burrito with jalapeno peppers and a lovely sauce, or uh, veggie fajitas or beans and rice, or I can go to a sushi bar. I wouldn't have the fish sushi, but have the, the cucumber roll or the asparagus roll or the sweet potato roll, mm -hmm. um, or go Vietnamese or go uh, Thai or Ethiopian or, or all of these cuisines. Mm -hmm. If you say, no, you can't have any of that. Go back to Fargo and just eat your roast beef, baked potatoes and corn. Say, right. wait a minute, wait, <laughs> you know, I like what I'm eating now. So. In our research studies, we transition people to a plant-based diet. And they do have a moment of doubt. 
for the first yeah. week or so. They, oh my God, you know, how's this going to work? And, yeah. and what does my family think? Yeah. But pretty soon you discover, number one, you are healthier, a yeah. lot healthier. Number two, you like it. And you, and you don't miss the things that you thought you couldn't live without. It's just like quitting smoking. You quit smoking and you got a big moment of doubt. Um, like, oh, can I do this? But once three or four weeks has gone by and your shirt doesn't stink um, and, you, and you think, I'm, you know, I think, I think I've conquered this. You couldn't, you, you, somebody couldn't pay you to light up a cigarette at that point. Right. Um, the only thing I have to say is that breaking a meat habit is way easier than quitting smoking. Although I think the cheese habit might be a little tough. It's quite a, <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> it is. People get hooked on it, even though it smells like old socks, but they can break that habit too. Good point. Well, I want to talk with you about, there's been a lot of talk on the microbiome these past few years, and I see digestive issues all the time. And this is just in the urgent care. Um, so GERD is a huge problem. And literally just the other day in the urgent care, I had this poor 30 year old guy. He was, in there for the you know the other end of the intestinal tract problem and he told me i've been suffering this reflux and this gi my doctor i said we need to see your gi doctor and you know figure this out and he said i was just there and he put me on some medication and i said well you need to do some diet changes there's a lot of things that you can do to feel better i mean you're 30. he looked at me and he said you are the first person that's told me that i may not have to take this medication forever and i can feel better that was surprising to me. I was like, wow. I mean, that's literally like, this is reflux we're talking about, you know? Um, so how do you think the vegan diet can improve the microbiome? Okay. Well, the first thing to do for any patient who has GERD, you got, you got acid that's in your stomach and it's going up in your esophagus and make right. you feel rotten. And so you're taking all kinds of medications. Um, okay. The medications work. Uh, however, do yourself a favor. Just try this. For the next month or six weeks, no animal products at all. And, and, and keep oils really low too, not a lot of fried junk. Mm -hmm. And eat vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans. Try our recipes, whatever, just give this a try. And for the majority of people, not only does their weight start coming down and their blood sugar gets better and their cholesterol gets better and their digestion sorts out, but their GERD goes away. And right. now we, I don't know entirely why that is. Some people have said, the stomach empties more rapidly, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, I do have a, a medical friend who says his personal belief is that um, chicken and other high protein foods just sit in the stomach longer and stimulate continued acid production. Mm -hmm. It would stop if you had uh, plant-based foods. Whatever the reason, give it a try and just see. But you asked about the microbiome. You've got bacteria in your, gut, in your digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And just in the same way as if you've got a garden, if you're planting roses, use one kind of soil. If you're planting a cactus, you'd use a different kind of soil. Mm -hmm. Well, the bacteria in your digestive tract are different depending on what they're growing in. So let's say I'm eating chicken and fish and I'm eating meat. I'm eating a very high protein, a high fat, high cholesterol, low fiber diet. Unhealthy bacteria thrive in that environment. Mm -hmm. The minute you throw all that out and you eat high fiber healthy, grains, vegetables, fruits, beans, healthy bacteria start to grow. And there was a wonderful research study at the University of Pittsburgh where African-American men were brought into the study uh, and they were eating and not such a healthy diet. I mean, they were eating an American diet, right. um, chicken and other kinds of meat and dairy products. The, the researchers also brought in a group of people from rural South Africa. Uh, black men in Africa, and they switched diets. Uh, the people in Africa started eating the Pittsburgh diet, and the people in Pittsburgh started eating the rural African diet, which was root vegetables and beans and healthy food. And within two weeks, the gut microbiomes changed. Wow. The, the people starting eating the meat products started to develop a very unhealthy gut bacteria, uh, gut bacteria and the, the opposite hurt happened here in the United States. So your digestive tract loves plants and that allows the healthy bacteria to thrive and boost your immune system yeah. keep you healthier so, yes um so i don't think it'd be anybody surprised to have you on here as saying that you should eat you know more broccoli um but i'm so excited to talk about your book and how the food impacts 
hormones and how powerful it is not only to improve life and longevity, but improve the quality of life. So I thought um, this would be a good time just to dive into your book and talk about it. I have it right with me and it's an awesome book. It's funny because as I was reading it, so many people, I'd be carrying it from place to place at work and they would say, oh gosh, I need help with that, that area. You know, I mean, the hormone k -wire is crazy, you know? So it's definitely a needed book. Um, it was a great book and I learned a lot from it. Um, could you talk a little bit? I love the way, because I've listened to you talk about hormones and I think you make it so easy to understand. So I thought before we talk about that, how it relates to food and health that you could just describe hormones a little bit in general, how they work. Sure. Um, hormones are compounds that are made in your body somewhere uh, and they go to another part of your body through the bloodstream and they, and they give directions to how that other part of your body is supposed to function. So for example, um, in uh, a woman's body, the ovaries make estrogens, female sex hormones. And so the estrogens get into the bloodstream and they go to the uterus and the other reproductive organs and get them ready for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So in a man's body, the, the testes make testosterone, the male hormone, which goes in the bloodstream, I guess, to his brain and makes him want to run for president. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, your, your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone that gets in the blood and it goes to your cells of your body to give you energy. Mm -hmm. Or insulin is made in your pancreas. It's a hormone. It goes to the cells of the body to get sugar inside. So in every case, a hormone is like a letter in the mail. It's made in one place and it shoots out to another place. It says, do this. But letters in the mail, sometimes you don't get any letters. That's not good. Sometimes you get too much mail. That's not good. You need to be in the middle. You need to be in balance. So when it comes to estrogen or testosterone or thyroid hormone or anything, you need the right amount, not too little, not too much. And where we see problems is let's take estrogens, too much estrogen, mm -hmm. menstrual cramps, endometriosis, fertility issues, and probably breast cancer mm -hmm. are in your future uh, in, to a much greater extent if there's too much estrogen in your blood. Um, so what I was struck by and what our research helped us to sort out is that foods can be used to control these hormones. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, you can control menstrual cramps. Okay? I mean, can you imagine? Um, you can control fertility issues to a great degree. You can reduce cancer risk based on what you eat. Mm -hmm. we, we have evidence that we can control our thyroid and, and certainly diabetes and other things. So instead of just being the victim of hormone haywire, mm -hmm. let's be in charge of it. Let's tell our hormones what to do and get back, get back to health. Well, also with the fertility aspect, I mean, you talked about how it affects both men and women. Yes, and dramatically so. Um, there was a, a case that I described uh, in this book, uh, mm -hmm. I and mean, there are many cases. Um, we were doing a, a study on menstrual pain uh, where we were using a plant-based diet because if you eat a lot of fiber and you eat relatively little fat, estrogen levels come down a little bit and that means that menstrual pain will not be so severe. And so we were doing a research study with Georgetown University School of Medicine and cramps get better on this diet. But in the course of doing this study, one of the women who began this vegan diet, she had thought she was infertile going into the study. Um, she told me about she had had these examinations and she and her husband were evaluated and it wasn't him, it was her. She didn't ovulate. And for years, they, they, they had just given it up. The second month, that she was on the healthy plant-based diet. She came into our laboratory and she said, Dr. Barnard, I've got some news for you. <laughs> she was pregnant. And I, I saw her later, she came to a lecture I gave, she had three children. Wow. Um, or the, I described the story of Catherine Lawrence, who's um, quite an amazing individual. She was in the Air Force. Uh, she had developed endometriosis, um, which is a tough disease. It was really painful. It there are really cells is. that are supposed to be lining the uterus attach all around the abdomen. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Uh, she adopted this diet. Uh, her endometriosis totally went away. Um, she was able to avert a hysterectomy. Um, she had thought she was infertile as well as a result of the endometriosis. She has three kids. Um, that offers so much hope to people because infertility is a huge problem in, in America. I mean, it's huge. Well, how many couples are spending a fortune on evaluations right. and treatments and right. where... And where they're worried, it's, 
it's, it, it should not be this way, but it is this way where there's a sense of embarrassment or shame or you're letting down your mom or, you know, all this unfortunate stuff. And, and, and then lovemaking degenerates into some sterile medical uh, exercise right. of now's the time. And you think, well, wait, 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 wait. What's not natural in our life? And what is right. not natural in our life is Velveeta and right. fried chicken and all this junk that, right. that, that we grew up with and we accept it as normal but it's driving our hormones in the wrong direction. And men too. Um, there was an amazing study looking at cheese. Uh, men consuming the most cheese have the worst sperm counts. And what we believe is happening is that the, the estrogens that come from the cow on, on dairy farms, the cows are making estrogen all day long, uh, it gets in the milk and it's only a trace, but it is more than enough to mm -hmm. goof up a man's uh, sperm production. So the idea is throw that stuff out. Well, you talk about how when it's made into cheese, I mean, it's more concentrated. Right. As um, opposed to just drinking milk. Yeah, and, and even the milk itself. Um, it, right. the, the problem is that cows are artificially inseminated annually on dairies. And yeah. the cow is pregnant for nine months out of 12, and they're milked right. during much of their pregnancy. And right. a pregnant cow makes estrogen. And you take a pail of milk out of the cow, send it to a laboratory, and they will actually be able to tell you how far along in pregnancy that cow was. I mean, you can measure it. And so it goes, and nobody takes the estrogen out. Um, it's in the carton of milk, it's in your yogurt, but in cheese, um, what you do when you make cheese is you get rid of the water and you concentrate the fatty parts and mm -hmm. that's where the estrogen goes. So- um, It's risky. It's risky. Eating it's it's risky in, in every respect. Milk. And, and you, you think, well, how much do people eat? Well, the average person eats 37 pounds of it. I was so surprised to hear that. You don't think about it, you know? It's, it's plus butter, plus ice cream, plus milk, plus yogurt, plus the dairy products baked into cookies and cakes and, and right. things. And, and you're dosing yourself with estrogen. And where I really worry is the person who naively thinks that that's the source of calcium. So my six-year-old son or my eight-year-old daughter, I'm going to give them this uh, cheese products which we all think of as normal, you're dosing them with the reproductive hormones from a cow with every bite of it, not realizing that the cow didn't even make the, the calcium that you're trying to get anyway. The cow just ate it in grass and you can eat it in broccoli and kale and collards and any green leafy vegetable, they have calcium in them. Well, I mean, it's been instilled in us that milk does a body good. It's a healthy thing. You know, I've had people telling me they're trying to eat more cheese to get more calcium. I'm like, no, back off. <laughs> There's other ways. So I think that's hard as a mindset. I mean, that's what they've been told. It's, it's marketing and we all grew up with it. And, and when you learn right. things really at a really young age, it's harder to set them aside. But, um, but when, when people get away from dairy products, they're delighted. And uh, speaking of infertility, there was a, 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 another case I described in the book of a young woman who had PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, oh, yeah. which is, um, it's largely genetic. Yeah. However, uh, diet choices influence its expression mm -hmm. and exactly what you think happens. I mean, she went on a whole plant-based diet and uh, got pregnant right away wow. um, with it. So d don't get me wrong. I'm not encouraging everybody just to start making more babies now. You, know, you take your <laughs> right. time. You take right. your time. <laughs> right. But, but if, 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 if people are struggling with this, look at your diet. Right. Well, since we're kind of on women's health, um, I want to talk a little bit about breast cancer because obviously it's huge and in relation to estrogen and um, I found it interesting in the book you talk about sex uh, hormone binding globulin and how it keeps your hormones in check and I think that's just interesting because if you think about the free estrogen you it makes total sense how that can be harmful and contribute to breast cancer. Yeah, this is a little bit complicated. I, I don't want people to feel like they have to have a PhD, but let me just describe it. <laughs> estrogen, estrogen circulates in your blood. And estrogen is sneaky. It's a very small, tiny hormone that can enter a breast cell and go straight through to the DNA in the nucleus. And your, your own estrogen will go into the nucleus and damage your DNA, and that can cause a cancer cell to form. Mm. So you need a little bit of estrogen in your life to be healthy, but you don't want to have the excesses of it. And a lot of things can cause an excess. But so we talked about getting away from dairy. Um, increasing fiber reduces estrogen in a good way. Uh, reducing fat also helps. 
But um, we've discovered an interesting thing a number of years ago, that when people follow a plant-based diet, the body makes more of what you described, sex mm -hmm. hormone binding globulin. Mm -hmm. A globulin is just a protein. Mm -hmm. And a sex hormone binding globulin is a big, massive protein that estrogen will stick to. So it's, it's circulating in your blood. And as long as estrogen is parked on this SHBG molecule, it's not doing anything. It's mm -hmm. leaving you alone. So you, you, you want some estrogen, but you don't want huge amounts of it entering your breast cells causing cancer. Right. Plant-based diet increases the amount of SHBG. It's like an aircraft carrier. So the, the, the fighter jets settle down on the aircraft carrier. They do no mischief. So uh, plant-based diet increases SHB in your, in your blood, and that's a good thing. What about alcohol as it relates to breast cancer? Well, I you know am, a lot of people are like, just relax with some red wine, but you mentioned in your book, it's not necessarily a good idea. Yeah, I, I hate to say it. Um, it clearly increases breast cancer risk. Mm. And, and even, even at one drink a day, if, if it's every day, um, the, the cancer risk is higher. So I encourage women to either avoid it or have it. If you're having it, have it be modest and intermittent. Okay. Uh, not your every day. If every day um, your job is so rotten that you got to go home and have a drink, it's time to win the lottery. <laughs> right. That's a good point. And what about menopause? I know a lot of people were like, talk about menopause. It really affects me. And I think, um, I think what's important is there, I wanted to ask you about hormone replacement as far as what you've learned about of the negativity, you know, the negative points of it and if bioidentical is a better option in your, in your opinion. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have all the best answers for menopause. I mean, it, we, it is a significant uh, change of life for many people. Um, but a couple things should be perhaps said. Uh, anthropologists back in the 70s and 80s and 90s made some amazing observations and they found that women in Japan tended not to describe mm -hmm. hot flashes very much mm -hmm. uh, compared to say women in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so at first it seemed, well, they're being reticent. They don't want to talk about their health. So in-depth interviews were held and it's true. They just really weren't having them. And they would talk with their gynecologist. They said, no, they, they sometimes they would talk about shoulder pain during, you know, that age of life or, or whatever, but they just weren't having hot flashes very much. There was no even, no, it wasn't even a word for them. Then McDonald's comes and sets up shop in Tokyo and there's all the fast food places. And many women started westernizing their diets and several things happened. Uh, people started gaining weight. Uh, depression, oddly enough, became more, more common. Cardiovascular disease came up. Uh, breast cancer rates doubled in the women who westernized. And we started to see a lot more hot flashes. And we think, okay, maybe that's unique to Japan, but it's not. Uh, if you look at, say, uh, the rural Mexico, mm -hmm. and the diet was really beans and tortillas and not much meat and really not much dairy at all, mm -hmm. um, there was really not much hot flashes. And you saw this in other places too. So what we think is happening is that let's say in America, you grow up on a diet that doesn't have much fiber in it because you're eating chicken, and pork chops and burgers. Um, and you're, you're not getting much fiber, you're getting a lot of fat, and you're eating cheese with its estrogen. It seems as if that causes estrogen levels to be chronically elevated mm -hmm. so that the body gets used to that. And then at, at menopause, your, your estrogen level is gonna fall and it's a more violent fall. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to say in Japan where people are on a plant-based, more or less plant-based diet, uh, generally speaking throughout their life. And the change is just not that dramatic uh, yeah. for them. So that, that could be it. Uh, now, now having said that, uh, let's say you've got hot, hot flashes, you can't make the clock go backwards and eat a healthier diet now. Um, although I would encourage people who are way before menopause do a low fat, healthy plant-based diet now and see if you don't do better. Um, the, I don't think we have perfect solutions really uh, many women have found soy is better. Soy makes their hot flashes reduced. Um, for some women, it's got to be more than soy milk and tofu. They, they will use actual soy protein powders. And I would say maybe 40% of women get quite substantial benefit from that. The others don't seem to. Um, if, if, uh, and if you take uh, hormone replacement therapy, that will knock out the hot flashes. But your doctor will say to you, you can't do this. Uh, you can't do this for very long mm. because it's going to it's going to increase your risk of breast cancer, blood clots, uh, all kinds of, of of issues. And so eventually, the doctor says, "Well, we got we got to stop. I don't feel safe about this anymore." And so you stop. And what happens? The hot flashes come. Right. Um, you've just kind of deferred it. 
Um, so, and, and many people don't like the idea of hormones anyway, because the most, what had been the most popular one, Premarin, comes from horse urine. Um, I but, read that, I had no idea. Oh, it's great. Well, Premarin is short for pregnant mare's urine. The, the mares are impregnated and then their urine is collected with this kind of creepy system. Um, luck, yeah. Luckily, all the other brands are not dry from horses, luckily. So I would definitely skip that one. Um, <laughs> if, if you're talking about a sexual uh, issue uh, like vaginal dryness and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and painful intercourse and that kind of thing, I, I would encourage women to not use a systemic steroid or, or um, uh, hormone that, that you're swallowing. Use a local one in a cream. And that way, the, we don't have, I don't think, quite enough evidence, but the evidence we have so far <clears throat> does not show significant, uh, significant enough systemic absorption to measurably increase cancer risk. Now, stay tuned. We may know more later, but the mm -hmm. best data we have now is that's a better way to go. Well, um, in relation to the soy, um, I was reading something by Dr. Greger, and he was talking about the benefits of soy and as a protection against breast cancer. And a lady had commented saying that, no, if you've ever had breast cancer, you can never have soy again. So I think there's some confusion or misconceptions about that. Yeah, um, there are, there's a lot of misconfusion, but, but Dr. Greger is right about that. And the woman who, who raised that point, she's, she's not accurate, but she's quoting what she's read on the internet or, or maybe even what she had been mistakenly told. Um, if you look on the internet, you'll, you'll see people saying, uh, don't have soy if you had breast cancer in the past. And that's really a mistake. But here, here's, here's where that idea came from. Back in the 30s, soy products were shown to contain isoflavones. Mm -hmm. And isoflavones are natural compounds. And, and they're not just in soy, there's some, and some other plants too. But they attach to the estrogen receptor on a breast cell. So researchers thought, oh my God, if a woman has soy, she'll develop breast cancer. Or if she's got breast cancer, it will stimulate the cancer to grow. So that's where all this came from. Okay. However, researchers have had more than enough time to see if this is true. And so back in about 2004, I think it was, there were at that point maybe eight studies had been finished. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be exactly the opposite. That the, the, the way these studies work is you, you bring in people, women, who consume a fair amount of soy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Asian women or Asian American women, who, some of whom are consuming tofu and miso and tempeh and lot, and you compare them to women who aren't consuming much soy at all. Maybe from the same culture, but they're avoiding soy. And the jury came right in and said, it's really quite clear. The women consuming the most soy have the least risk of breast cancer, about 30% reduced. And then about 10 years later, 2014 thereabouts, we at this point had about 40 some studies or more. And it confirmed it. It showed exactly the same thing. The women consuming the most soy had the least breast cancer. But then to this woman's point that, that you described, mm -hmm. um, we now have at least five studies on women previously diagnosed with breast cancer. Those who consume the most soy have about a 30% reduction in the likelihood of dying of their cancer. See, that's huge. That's so important. That's why I wanted to cover this. I mean, well, yes, so important uh, for women to know. It's it, yes, and so, and so it goes back to why, why, why is this? And let me draw an analogy. Get in your car. Look at the floor of your car. You see a pedal on the right. That's a gas pedal. You turn on your car and you step on that. What happens? Your car goes. Right. Right next to it is another pedal, and that's the brake. And you're driving along and you step on the brake. What happens? Exactly the opposite. Your car stops. Back in 1930, we didn't understand estrogen receptors to the extent that we do now. You have alpha receptors, you have beta receptors. Soy attaches preferentially to the beta receptor. Think of soy as stepping on the brake. So let's say um, a well-meaning person, maybe a doctor who, who is not very well educated says, you've had breast cancer, you should never have soy. Telling a woman that is condemning her to a 30% higher risk of dying of her cancer. Now, you don't have to have soy if you don't want it, mm -hmm. but it does not cause cancer and it does not increase the risk of dying of your cancer. It does precisely the opposite. And, and, and by the way, um, although I encourage people to have organic tofu or organic soy milk, because it's not GMO, frankly, they all seem to work. 
Okay. And it doesn't have to necessarily be fermented soy. The non-fermented, so fermented soy is like tempeh or miso. Okay. The non-fermented ones are soy milk, uh, tofu. They all seem to, to work. Okay. Um, so there you go. Uh, I, I would definitely not avoid it. And plus, if you're having soy milk, it's, you're not having cow's milk, if you're, which is good. Right. It's good to make that switch. If you're having the soy sausage, you're not having the pork sausage. So, so it, it's always better than what it replaces. Right. Um, well, so I want to switch over to diabetes. And it obviously affects 1.4 million people a year. I mean, and not only that, just the pre-diabetics alone, it's like 88 million people, which is scary numbers. And there's just such huge misconceptions surrounding diabetes. And honestly, even for me, listening to you talk about like the real underlying cause of insulin resistance and diabetes is huge. And I thought you could touch on that a little bit um, to explain that process. Yes, um, it's important to understand what insulin does and how it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Insulin is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a hormone made in your pancreas, gets into the bloodstream and it goes to say your muscle cells or your liver cells. And its job, insulin's job, it's to act like a key. So when the insulin leaves the pancreas and gets to the surface of your muscle, it, it opens up, it, it attaches to the surface of the cell, just like a key in a lock, and it opens up little channels that let glucose come into the cell. Sugar comes into the cell. Why does it want to do that? Because sugar is the fuel for your cell. Mm -hmm. Sh sugar is what allows you, your cells to move. It allows you to, to walk and to think and so forth. And if you don't have insulin, your muscle cell can't accept the sugar in. So uh, what could go wrong? Well, let's say for lunch, I had a um, chicken salad sandwich with a lot of mayo and some cheese. Um, and I thought, isn't that delicious? And the fat from the mayonnaise and from the cheese and the chicken got into my bloodstream and it went into my muscle cells. The fat packs into the muscle cells and the more fat that builds up inside the muscle, the less insulin is, be able, is able to get the channels open. It's sort of like if some neighbor kid put chewing gum in your front door lock when you were away, mm -hmm. your key doesn't work anymore. Well, you don't have chewing gum inside your cells. You've got fat inside your cells right. from meat, from dairy products, from fryer grease or whatever. And that stops insulin from working. It's called insulin resistance. So at that point, when your cells are all filled with fat, you eat an apple and your blood sugar goes higher than it would otherwise. And you think, what's that about? Or you eat some rice or some bread and your blood sugar goes higher. And you think, gee, I'm not eating apples anymore. I'm not gonna eat rice anymore. That was not the problem. The problem was that your cells were filled with fat and they couldn't accept the sugar. So it's building up there. Right. What's the answer? The answer is stop eating animal products. If you do that, there is zero animal fat in your diet. And you keep the oils really low too and the, the fat starts to leave the cell, it starts to dissipate, and your insulin starts working again. And if you have diabetes, it starts getting better. And in some cases, it absolutely goes away. If all you're gonna do is avoid bread, that is a Band-Aid approach that will keep your blood sugars a little bit healthier, but it's not gonna cure the disease. Well, I think that's a huge misconception. It's the, the carbs. I mean, that's one thing that people have even said to me, well, on that diet, you're eating a lot of carbs, aren't you? And, and so I think that you nailed it. It's all about the fat and the saturated fat, and even the oils that people think are good for them, the coconut oil, the olive oil, um, that's not necessarily healthy either. Um, carbohydrate is the natural fuel for your body. Your Ferrari drives on gasoline. Your muscles drive on, on glucose. So sources of glucose are carbohydrate. That's the source. That's the only source. Um, so if, and keep in mind, uh, people, I, I know what you mean. People are kind of kooky about, about carbohydrate. But that, let's go back to Japan. What were they eating in the 1950s and 60s when they were the skinniest, longest lived people on the planet? Rice, phenomenal amounts of rice. And when they stopped eating rice and started eating more chicken and, and greasy stuff, diabetes rates increased. So no, healthy carbohydrate rich foods are good for you. Now you can ruin anything. You can overly refine them. So you've got white bread that's like you know, a marshmallow. That's not healthy. Um, but eating healthful vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, that's the answer. Um, one thing I want to make sure that we make a point of, and then I didn't realize, I don't think a lot of people, it's just a fiber. I feel like with this diet, people talk about so much about protein and not about fiber. And you're 
book really talked about how good fiber is for you. And I don't, I think that, you know, people are so focused on protein that, and even people have commented to me about, I've given them different proteins. So I said, well, those are incomplete proteins. You know, you're not getting enough protein. And my feeling has changed a lot. It's like, I'm more concerned about the fiber. Right. Um, people are not low in protein. And it's not true that plants have incomplete proteins. That's sort of 1940s thinking. Um, but plants have the building blocks of protein. Those are amino acids. And some have more of one, some have more, than, uh, more of another. Um, but virtually all plants do have all the essential amino acids with very few exceptions. And a normal plant-based diet, um, you, you have a variety of foods and you easily get all the protein you need. You're not gonna, feed, you're not gonna see anybody in your clinic all day who is protein deficient. You're just not gonna see it. Okay. Um, what you are gonna see is a lot of people who, just as you said, they are fiber deficient. And you go into any CVS or Walgreens or whatever, and just look at the, the fiber supplement aisle. And all the people buying Metamucil and all these things, and people getting AIDS for constipation, and there are commercials for it on TV. If people follow a plant-based diet, the vegetables and fruits give you fiber naturally. And the reason that people are constipated in the vast majority of cases is that they're just not eating what nature is trying to give them. There is not a scrap of, of fiber. There's not any plant roughage. Well, it makes it's total sense. Right. Um, it makes total sense, especially if it's about the estrogen, how it flushes it away. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. You know, it's like so easy to do, you know. Um, I do want to mention one thing. Um, and you talked about your book about how a vegan diet, especially in the times when everybody is so anxious and how even just this diet alone can improve mood and depression. We discovered this actually by accident. We were doing a study with the car insurance company, Geico. Uh, in 10 different cities around the country, uh, they implemented a plant-based diet at work uh, in the cafeteria and weekly classes. And uh, what you would think happened, did happen. Uh, people right. lost weight and their diabetes got better. Right. But mood started improving quite substantially. Uh, depression went down, anxiety went down. And when we track job absenteeism records, people were at work. You know, they, <laughs> they, their job absenteeism got better. And so other researchers have looked at this and the data are a little bit kind of a mixed bag. But overall, it does look like a transition to a plant-based diet improves mood. So why is that? It's probably because it's improving the gut bacteria or and or it's an anti-inflammatory diet and inflammation affects the brain. For whatever reason, uh, it should be part of our wellness program. Makes total sense. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit about erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease, because I don't think a lot of men realize this, and I see a lot of men on their medicine list from Viagra, and I love how you actually focus on getting to the root cause. Right. Well. Erectile dysfunction is not caused by performance anxiety. Um, it's caused by a lack of blood flow. And so if a man has reduced blood flow to his private parts, I mean, nothing's gonna happen. He, he, he needs blood flow for his system to work. Um, but the problem is this, if he's got erectile dysfunction, that's a sign that his blood flow is being impaired by artery disease. He's got atherosclerotic lesions. Those are little blister-like lesions forming in the arteries that go to his private parts. The reason this is an issue is that if he's got them there, he's probably got the same disease process in his coronary arteries to his heart, and even in the arteries leading to his brain. And so that means, in fact, cardiologists recognized this a long time ago, that a man who's got erectile dysfunction in his mid-50s is at much higher than average risk for a heart attack or stroke within the next three to five years. So Viagra, sure, you, know, you can take it if you want to, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause this to go away. Um, it, won't, it won't cure your heart disease, but what will is a plant-based diet, throwing out the tobacco, dealing with stress, lacing up your speaker so you're exercising, treating your body right, and in the majority of cases, you can see dramatic cardiovascular improvements in a relatively short period of time. Which is huge. I mean, look at how long cardiovascular disease has been the number one cause of death. Oh yeah, and when people come in here for diabetes or whatever it is, we put them on a plant-based diet, they often didn't tell us about their erectile dysfunction, but they tell us that it, it suddenly miraculously went away after six or eight weeks on a vegan diet, and, and that makes a believer out of them. Well, and improves their quality of life again. Yeah, I'm not sure how their wives feel about it, but yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, 
we didn't really talk too much about men, but I wanted to touch on the dairy connection with men and prostate cancer and also fish oil supplements as it relates to prostate cancer. Yeah, big surprise. Harvard University did, had a study called the Physician's Health Study. And it turned out that the men consuming the most dairy had about a 21% higher risk of prostate cancer. And so was, was that just a fluke? They did another study called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, and it was much bigger. And the same thing happened. That, that men, dairy consuming men had substantially more prostate cancer, in this case, about 60% more. What we think is happening, well, what we know happens, is a man drinks milk. The proteins and sugars in the milk trigger the production of what's called insulin like growth factor. That is a potent stimulus for cancer cell growth. Um, and there are some other physiological effects too, but we think that that just causes the growth of cancer cells. It probably does the same in a woman's body too. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's the first thing is, is note to self, don't drink milk, don't, don't consume dairy products um, if you want a healthy prostate. But the other thing was fish oil. And this was a complete shock. Uh, studies showed that men consuming fish oil had more prostate cancer too. And the studies were done for other reasons. They were mm -hmm. done to see it, would it protect a heart, which it doesn't seem to, but mm -hmm. the men with getting more fish oil had more prostate cancer. Um, this was pretty much dismissed for a long time, or, or researchers didn't want to believe it, because you, you couldn't figure out why. And, and to this day, I don't know why, mm -hmm. why, why this happens. But uh, it does. Uh, but researchers have, have pretty clearly uh, shown that fish oil supplements increase the risk of prostate cancer. So um, wouldn't, ta wouldn't take them. That's that's critical information, honestly, because it's so pushed for the heart. I mean, I see so many patients on it. Yeah, but I have to say the the sawdust has fallen out of that transmission. I mean, it, the, they, they really don't work mm -hmm. very well. It's been a big commercial product and, and whether they have any benefit uh, at all is is in doubt. But but with regard to the cardiac function, they're their, their, their benefit has really been pretty much set aside. So do you recommend taking a different form to get your omega-3 supplement in? Um, the, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where, right, what I think science hasn't yet answered. Um, it does look like people who are, whose blood levels of EPA and DHA are low, that the, some studies have suggested they might be at higher risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and so you think, okay, if I take these supplements, will this kill me or not? Um, you can online get vegan DHA. Okay. It's plant derived, it's not from a fish oil. Uh, it doesn't smell like fish and you can take it and you can also test yourself. Uh, there are companies like Omega Quant that if you send them, it's about 60 bucks or something like that, they'll send you a card, you put a drop of blood on it and send it in. They'll tell you how much, you know, if your DHA level is low or not. So you can test yourself. Um, and this, the, the supplements will raise your DHA blood level. The question is whether that'll prevent Alzheimer's disease. Nobody really knows. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where the science is right now. But anyway, the point is, if you were going to take a supplement, don't take the fish one. You know, take the plant-derived one. They're algae-derived. They're cleaner. They're better in every way. I think, speaking of Alzheimer's, you can see how a plant-based diet would be beneficial towards Alzheimer's in decreasing the inflammation yeah. in the brain you know, improving that, which none of us want? Uh, let's start before you get the, the symptoms. Um, there's every reason to believe that if you're on a plant-based diet, we can reduce the risk of developing this disease. That's awesome. Well, if somebody wants to switch over to a plant-based diet, where do you tell them to start? Take two steps. Take a week or so and just try out different foods. Uh, see what's vegan that you really like. So oatmeal for breakfast, bean burrito for lunch, uh, spaghetti with tomato sauce instead of meat sauce for dinner. Take a week, explore your options. Then take three weeks and do it. Eat the foods that you've identified. At the end of three weeks, your life will have changed. Go to our website, pcrm.org. There's lots of tips for you there. We also have a free app on your iPhone or your Android. Okay. It's called the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. Okay. Um, free, free app. 21 days worth of menus, recipes, cooking videos, change your life. All right. Well, um, so if you could, I'm just going to ask you one thing. What do you recommend people do today? What's the one thing that they can do to impact their life the most? I would suggest that people, I mean, I could think of a million things that people could do. Right. But I, th I think the, the, the first thing to do is to, to shore up your knowledge base. 
understand why you might want to do this, whether you pick up one of my books or, or whether it's Michael Greger's book or somebody else, Dean Ornish's wonderful books. Um, educate yourself, learn one or two things about how foods affect you. That will change your life. Okay. So I thought I would just do a few little fun questions. Um, and some of it I've gotten from listening to you on other things. Um, so, so I'm still rather new in this process and I've never made tempeh yet, but I heard you eat it every morning. So yeah. how do you prepare it? You take the tempeh, slice it into little strips, um, and you, you put it in it's a little bit of soy sauce on both sides, just two seconds, you don't have to marinate it. Throw it in a nonstick pan, cook it on both sides, and it's kind of vegan bacon. Okay, all right, I'm gonna try it. And what about, another thing I heard that I did not even know is about uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, like broccoli and cauliflower. I never knew the whole eating them raw versus cooked, and I, I heard you mention that. Cook them, they're much more digestible if they're cooked. Okay, and also another thing I heard you talking about, which keto is huge in this, you know, the whole diet thing, and I heard you mention an NIH study, and I thought it would be kind of fun to discuss that just a briefly about what the outcome was for uh, vegan versus keto. Uh, on a ketogenic diet, people don't, well, a couple things happen. Uh, when people restrict carbs, first of all, they don't lose fat as much as they will on a low fat diet. Um, they may lose water weight, um, mm -hmm. but they don't lose fat as much. And also when people have unrestricted unrestr uh, access to foods on a, on a plant-based diet, they actually, because it's so high in fiber, they end up actually eating fewer calories on a ketogenic diet. They end up eating more calories. Okay. Um, so do it plant-based. Okay. And lastly, I mean, this can just be, um, well, first of all, you know, turkey dinner is the, you know, centerpiece for most Americans. So what is your turkey? Uh, what does your Thanksgiving look like? Everything other than the turkey, the sweet <laughs> potatoes and all the greens and everything else. Okay. Fine. Now, if you, if you want to have fun with it, you can buy a tofurkey um, okay. or one of those. You can do that. That'll be a con uh, conversation piece, I have to tell you. But uh, all the vegetables are welcome to, at my house. Okay. And then hypothetically, if you had to go to a fast food restaurant, just say that was your only option, which one would you go to and what would you have? Well, there's lots of choices. I might, if I had to go to Taco Bell, I'd get the bean burrito and hold the cheese and I'd add some jalapenos to it. If I went to Subway, I would say, uh, give me a sub with the lettuce and tomato and the cucumbers and the hot peppers and the red wine vinegar and toast it for me. And uh, <laughs> you'll do fine. Okay. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been awesome. And I, I seriously learn something every time I listen to you. Well, thank you so much. It's been fun. All right, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.